Hello there, I'm Steve from Mac84, and welcome to another video. Today we're going to be talking about the Macintosh Classic. Now the Macintosh Classic is one of those popular compact Macs that a lot of people seem to be coming into lately. Now these machines are not without their issues. Now the Macintosh Classic is an okay machine, it's not the best compact Mac out there. It was actually limited at the factory so it didn't compete with Apple's higher end systems, but that's a history lesson for another day. But essentially, the Macintosh Classic, the Classic 2, the SE, and the SE30 are some of the most common computers that are sent to me to work on and recap. So I have quite a lot of experience with these machines, and I've been able to repair most of them without too much trouble. Now my friend Logan from Crazy Tech Reviews, I'll put a link to his channel up here or here or in the video description text box somewhere, had a Macintosh Classic that was giving him nothing but issues. He picked up this machine a while back and was having problems with the analog board and then the logic board and all sorts of things. So I actually caught one of his live streams not too long ago where he was working on this Macintosh Classic computer. In that live stream he was trying to resolve an issue, and unfortunately without the magnification necessary to look at these small components he was having a bit of a problem. So I told Logan, stop right there, don't do any more potential damage to that board, why don't you send it to me and I'll take a good look at it under my microscope. So that's what he did, he sent me the board and I actually did a live stream of looking at his Macintosh Classic board. Now for those of you who did not sit through the three or four hour live stream, I'll sum it up for you. Essentially, he had a problem where of course the capacitors needed to be replaced, but there were some pad and trace issues on that board as well. For example, this capacitor's pad was gone. Therefore, there was no place for one side of a new capacitor to go. But I was able to carefully construct a new pad using some wire and attaching it to the existing lead next to where the pad once was. Even with magnification, this job can be very tricky and difficult to pull off successfully. Once the replacement pad was in place, I was able to successfully solder a new capacitor in that spot. One issue was the sound chip. He had removed the sound chip to try and resolve an issue nearby, but of course we had to fix up that area, put in some new traces, put in some new capacitors, and you know, fix up that whole region. So I was able to successfully do that, and when I got the machine all recapped and ready to go, I turned it on, and nothing. We had another problem, it wasn't just the capacitors. But then Logan told me that when he was messing around with the computer, he thinks he accidentally reinserted the Macintosh ROM in the wrong orientation, and that ROM got very, very warm, and it likely fried itself. Now the Macintosh ROM is the source of the Macintosh's power. Without this ROM the computer doesn't work and it doesn't act like a Mac. It doesn't really do anything much at all. With this particular model, the ROM is seated right here on this socket. If you put that ROM in the wrong orientation or in the wrong spot, you'll be in for some trouble. I'm going to cut him some slack because I've done this before, I've messed it up, but I was quick enough to understand what I did and I was able to unplug the machine before any damage was done. However, it's quite simple to screw up the orientation of the ROM on these Macintosh Classic computers, and I'll tell you why. The ROM socket here has two extra pins to the right of it. That is facing the battery holder over here. So if you take that ROM out and put that ROM back in, you could accidentally move it over by one space and actually screw up the orientation of that ROM and of course how the pins are connected to the socket. Now when Logan did this, the ROM got very, very hot and he told me that he thought he broke the ROM. So of course, when I went to test the machine after I recapped it, I decided to use my own ROM and it worked perfectly fine. That confirms that his ROM was the problem. Now if you don't have a replacement Macintosh ROM, you have one of two options. You can either find one online, let's say through eBay or somewhere else, and people are likely selling these if they have a computer they parted out, or let's say the logic board was damaged but the ROM was okay, that's one option. Or you could go ahead and get an EEPROM programmer or find someone who has one and ask them to make a replacement ROM for you. Since I didn't have a spare Macintosh ROM for this model, I decided to look into buying an EEPROM programmer. An EEPROM programmer allows you to read data from existing ROM chips and write data to new blank rewritable chips. Therefore, with the right blank chips and source data, you have the ability to make your own replacement ROMs. Now there's probably a legal gray area on this, they don't make these parts anymore, and we just want to make sure that these machines can work again. So in this case, I think it's perfectly acceptable to make a replacement ROM for this computer to get it up and running again. As long as the chips are still available, or an equivalent of them still are, you should be able to replace that ROM on the computer. 
Not all Macintosh ROMs are on removable chips. A lot of them in the later days were soldered directly onto the logic board, and later on in some machines, like the Macintosh SE30, the Macintosh 2 series, and later the PowerMac series, actually had their ROMs installed on these little modules that could easily slide into a socket on the logic board. So not all Macintosh ROMs are the same, so please keep that in mind when you're watching this video and maybe you get some inspiration to make your own ROMs, you just gotta be careful and do your research. While searching for information on programming ROMs, I came across an Amiga blog that someone was talking about making ROMs for their Amiga computer. Now it just happens to turn out that that specific model of Amiga computer used the very same type of a ROM that the Macintosh Classic did. It had the same amount of pins, etc. So what they suggested doing was ordering one of these for placement ROMs. So unlike the original ROM, which once it has been written cannot be written over, these ROMs are rewritable. They have a little window here that you could actually flash with some UV light for a period of time to erase the chip, and then you could write some new code to it. So that's exactly what this individual suggested. So now I found a replacement ROM that should work with my Macintosh Classic. The problem was finding a compatible EEPROM programmer to write the code to this chip. Now, although this is a 40 pin chip and a lot of EEPROM programmers out there can accommodate a 40 pin chip, this particular chip has a different pinout than most chips that those EEPROM programmers are willing to accept. Therefore, you had to use an adapter. In this case, there's this 16 bit adapter that snaps onto the EEPROM programmer that this individual used, which worked out for them. So after doing additional research, I decided to go ahead and order the same EEPROM programmer and adapter that I saw on that blog post. That individual had success writing their ROMs, and since it was using the same chip, I thought I would have a pretty good chance writing ROMs for this Macintosh. That is just what I purchased. I'm not saying to go and purchase the same thing. I'm sure there are other cheaper solutions out there, but I wanted to get this pretty quickly, and all the other alternatives I saw had a pretty long shipping time. So I decided to go ahead and pick out this one, and I'll see if it works out for my needs. Next up was buying some chips. Now not all chips are compatible with all logic boards, or even all revisions of those logic boards, so do your homework and be careful. However, I was able to find some chips on eBay. They were from overseas and they did take a while to get here, and I did follow some advice that others had given me about purchasing multiple chips, because not all of these would likely work. So if you buy a handful of them, at least you'll end up with one or two that should work out for your needs. So I finally got these chips in the mail. Let's hope they're the ones we need to fix Logan's Macintosh Classic. This is a GQ 4X version 4 or a GQ 4x4 USB 40 pin programmer with that optional 16 bit EEPROM adapter. Unfortunately, the software for this EEPROM programmer is Windows only, but thankfully it was actually pretty straightforward to use. I just had to click on the read button there and then I just typed in the number of the chip here. In my case, it was a 27C400. It actually gives you a nice little diagram of how to insert that chip, and it tells you if any additional hardware or adapters are required. I had already backed up my original Macintosh ROM when I got the EEPROM programmer and was awaiting these new chips in the mail, so I knew I had a backup of the Macintosh ROM that I could write to a new chip once they arrived. Now, you may be able to download these ROMs online and use them if you don't have an original. However, you must be careful because some ROMs need to be byte swapped before they can be written back to the original chip. If this is not done, the way the code is written back to the ROM will be something that that original computer is not expecting and things may not work. I put in the first chip and clicked the read button. This came back with a bunch of Fs, meaning that the chip was blank. So I attempted to write the ROM to this chip. Unfortunately, I ran into an issue. When I got to around the three percentage mark, the system just stopped and I got this error. Now I had two options. I could either try a different chip or I could use my EEPROM eraser to try and erase the chip and see if I could get it to work again. However, I just decided to try another chip from the package and see if that would work. So I put a new chip in the EEPROM programmer and tried to write the data to it again. To my delight, it worked. It took much longer to write the information than it did previously, so maybe that other chip just needed to be erased, or maybe it was defective. After the information was written to the ROM, it actually does a verify test to make sure that the information from the file that you provided is actually the same of the information that has been written to the ROM, and it appeared successful. So our next step was to test this chip on our Macintosh Classic logic board. Okay, we have our logic board plugged in with that new ROM. Let's turn it on.
Yes! So here's Logan's Macintosh Classic board with that brand new ROM, and it's working great. So I hope that this machine will bring him joy for years to come now that it's finally working again. This EEPROM programmer was a lot of fun to play around with, and I'm sure I'll figure out some other projects to use it with. But that's about it for this video. I hope you enjoyed this look at this EEPROM programmer and making a new ROM for that Macintosh Classic computer. It was a lot of fun to get it working again. If you like these sorts of videos, please consider subscribing to the channel. Make sure you click that little notification bell when you subscribe to be notified of when new videos get released or when I do a live stream. You could also follow me on Twitter and Instagram. My handle is Mac84TV. And if you want to support me on Patreon, go to patreon.com forward slash Mac84. For as little as a dollar a month, you get exclusive access to behind the scenes extras and early access to videos before they come out. So be sure to check that out. But that's it for now. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you right here next time on Mac84.